Welcome to Breaking Paradigms, a podcast where we talk about global perspectives on spatial planning in practice and theory by Constance Frech and Sarah Kouchi. Today, we invited experts to share their experiences on the data gap from the grassroots level to the researcher's perspective. This episode, we want to create awareness about different types of data gaps and the role existing and missing data plays in spatial planning. Please introduce yourself and give us a short insight into how you work with data. My name is Santiago Sanchez Guzman. I'm an architect and uh, infrastructure planner from Colombia. Um, I did a master in infrastructure planning in Stuttgart, and I'm writing my dissertation at the Vienna University of Technology with the supervision of Professor Rudolf Giffinger. Um, I have been working professionally in infrastructure planning and design in Colombia and in Austria. Um, I'm living in Austria the last 12 years of my life. I use data in different forms. I, uh, professionally, as architect, I use data to inform design, let's say to respond to the uh, characteristics of place. So um, in the process of design, I basically um, usually try to be in contact with the place, with the communities or with the user and to get informed of the necessities and requirements um, and basically um, how the information uh, can lead me to a better design. Um, in my research, I'm um, using data in another form. Uh, I acquire, I'm not using a methodology to acquire data from informal settlements uh, in Latin America, specifically in Medellin and Bogota. Uh, I have been using drones to capture uh, data, let's say images and videos, and then transforming this data to information, let's say to three-dimensional uh, three models. Um, to be able to talk with the communities about their own problems and to address um, vulnerabilities in, in the contexts. I'm Prince Andrea Defio, an, an entrepreneur and a creative director. I, I am trained as a food process engineer, but currently I'm working as the creative director and president of Antarctica Ghana, which is a creative organization that um, is positioned as the gateway to African creators. So what we do is trying to build a gaming ecosystem across um, 15 African countries and also the whole of Africa as well. Our game initially when we were creating a game, the idea was to reimagine city futures. And this actually heavily ties with um, mega cities in Africa. We ask ourselves the question that what will our, the, what will the city of our future look like? And we got to address, you know, or examine the various problems that we faced, you know, and come up with the main um, problem and develop a game around it. Like Lagos, which is a mega city in Africa, uh, they developed a game around traffic. Uh, with some other countries, it was about architecture. Um, with some other countries, it was actually about buildings, you know, so we actually had to um, walk around and take pictures of buildings. And this was actually generating data as well. And in to localize it, our game in Accra was to create awareness about sanitation. So it was dubbed Chronicles of Cleaning. And it told a story of a space commander who came from outer space to fight a filth monster in a scrapyard. And he had, he had lost his wife to the filth monster and he was here. So as a player, you have to embody that space commander and walk through Agbubuloshi through the maps and then the journey and journey to from start to finish, solving missions, solving tasks, taking pictures, scanning QR codes, having fun whilst learning about sanitation, you know? So that was like the concept of gamification that we used. That is how we worked with data and that is what our game is about. So 
And this whole project was uh, done in partnership with and in partnership and support from the Gote Institute. So it is available um, if you go to www.entarafrica.org. You can get to learn more about our organization and what we are doing across Africa, the amazing things that are doing across Africa in terms of um, games, creating a gaming ecosystem and also gamification as well. In the beginning of our organization, we created location-based games to you know, address um, the social, cultural and infrastructural frameworks of our cities. And speaking about cities, we in, in creating the location-based games, we work with data closely with uh, the use of um, Google Maps and then, you know, mapping and open streets and open maps as well. Um, from the perspective of Accra, um, we wanted to create um, awareness about sanitation in Abubulushi, which is like the largest scrapyard in West, Af West, of West Africa. And in getting to know about the place to develop, you know, concrete mission missions for the game, we had to know and use which data was available and in doing so, that is how we got to know about it. So more of the data was more uh, was environmental data and also maybe population data as well. So yeah, the caveat here is that uh, most of the data were free and available online, but to get concrete data, we also had to go there ourselves to conduct maybe uh, key informant interviews, like with some of the scrap dealers on site. We had to talk to them to see and be immersed in the environment to get uh, their own perspectives and to, you know, get concrete figures as well. Like maybe for instance, like how many tons of copper they burn and stuff like that. This data is not something that was easily accessible online. And even if it was, we didn't know where to actually get them because uh, it was like kind of a, a gap, you know, in getting that data. So yeah, we had to be there as, uh, our, be there ourselves, um, talk to the people and also online as well. So it's like a two way thing. We wanted to be accurate as possible, not to, you know, carry wrong information because in creating awareness, people need to know the, um, the true situation of, of what is at hand. Otherwise you'd be relaying wrong information. What's the problem? Because sometimes the online data is, uh, it hasn't been updated. So you can get data from like uh, 2016, but you know um, you know that times and, and seasons have changed. So you expect it to be updated, but then it hasn't. So that is a problem as well. And you don't want to be uh, conveying the wrong message. So. You see that you leave that out or you state that uh, in this year, this was the problem or this was the situation. Yeah. Um, this is this this is um, highly attributed to the fact that um, we are in a, like a fast moving, you know, age. Um, things are changing very rapidly. Like for instance, in Abubulushi, it is um, home to like um, 40,000 immigrants from the North. And this kind of change is like uh, every now and then. So um, two years or three years later, when I, when we are creating a game, I realized that the numbers had increased, but I, then I didn't have like the actual numbers as to to as to say that this is different from what I was seeing, you know, three years ago. So it highly attributed to like maybe um, the people who are there and also how things are fast and and rapidly changing. So well, my name is uh, Kea Nicholas Anthony. Um, mostly known as Kea Nemesis. I am an artist, a musician, and uh, lately I've been developing and designing games. I, I only started des designing games like last year because as part of a workshop with the Gute Institute and to Africa, slowly we got oriented and I already had ideas outside the game developing on how to, you know, how to have an impact on society uh, what what I've been working with uh, so far with data. Well, I'm, I'm I come from a third world country, which is uh, Uganda. Um, we we had to go out to uh, different locations to inform our mechanic, like the, to inform the mechanics we were building for for the game. We had to deal with things like, um, for example, we went to universities or we went to like uh, hospitals, and we we worked with like, for example how data is input, let's say childbirth, for example. The difference between uh, a, a demograph where you have children that have access to these average hospitals, whereby by the time the child leaves the hospital, the, the information is within the system, which will best inform the decision on, on what ailments they had or what treatments they could get. It's quite different in most areas whereby this data isn't there at all. So these children are born and 
they are almost non-existent. So yeah, we, we faced a huge problem as far as amassing data to inform our decision based on that, because the data we had only informed a certain group of people who could afford for their data to be put there. The, the other things was we wanted for the games to actually have an impact on the society uh, as far as, you know, framing how people thought about their environment, about the opportunities they had, and you know, how best to, to, to leap forward from what position you're in. To recruit um, brilliant minds that didn't know that they were brilliant, you know, just to give them the tools to, you know, think about it at least. But even that was hard because, you know, there's, no, there's nothing to work with. If you want to target two children, uh, if, you, if they're the ones you want to help or they're the ones you want to include in the program, you don't have an actual number to deal with. So, you know, like without the actual data to inform the decision or the plan that you think you have, it's, it's extremely difficult. It, it, it makes planning, uh, planning almost impossible. Uh, my name is Donnelly Bowen. I'm a professor emerita of political science and Middle East studies at Brigham Young University. And I, uh, I've worked uh, on Middle East questions for a, a long time. And over the last oh, 20 years, 25 years, we've been teaching a gender class. And the, my co-instructor is Valerie Hudson, who is now at Texas A&M University. And Valerie is the principal investigator of a project that she initiated and that I work with her on now. It's called the Woman Stats Project. And uh, you can find it at womanstats.org. And this is a research database of data about all aspects of women's life that's organized by nation state. And our basic purpose is to, to, to prove the fact that the status of women is linked to the fate of nations. We have an, a huge project that we've been working on for over eight years, and the book will be coming out in a couple of months, where we're able to demonstrate literally that the way women are treated, particularly within the family, has an enormous impact on the welfare and the well-being of not just women in these states, but it, on the states themselves. So we, um, with, with women's stats, it has introduced me to quantitative research. I've mostly done ethnographic and t uh, textual analysis. And so the women's stats project utilizes both quantitative and qualitative research. And essentially we have teams of researchers that scour all the published material. It's all open source. There is nothing secret or on the down low about anything that we use. So we scour materials worldwide for data on about 375 different variables. We've done so much research on this, but we put together everything that we've done and we pulled together what we call a syndrome, which is a syndrome of female subordination. So. You know, the question is, how do you prove that women are subordinated if you're not going to look at education or if you're not going to look at labor force participation? So what what we use is, first of all, levels of violence against women, which are widespread everywhere in the world. There is no country that scores well on levels of violence against women. We look at women's property. We look at inheritance rights. We look at patrilocal marriage and how prevalent it is. We look at son preference and whether the sex ratios are being altered. We look at age of marriage for girls. We look at family law and how inequitable it is. We look at bride price and dowry. We look at uh, polygyny. We look at femicide, killing women, which is something that we just had no idea how prevalent it was. We look at cousin marriage and we look at um, what happens in the case of rape. We also look at female genital cutting. And we put the scores, national scores on all of these together in what we call the syndrome. And then we have run the syndrome against literally hundreds of different um, variables. 
And what we found is that the syndrome is a better predictor of hu human development than anything else, that it's one of the best predictors of fragile state. In 90, 94% of our regressions, when we looked at political stability and freedom or autocracy, the syndrome turned out to be an explanatory variable. So the measure of women's household disempowerment was the most important. And we worked in a number of areas, political stability, governance, security and conflict, economic performance, health and well-being, uh, demographic security, education, social progress, environmental protection. So in other words, if women are severely subordinated in the home, it will have an impact on every aspect, not just of their lives, but of their nation state's performance. What kind of data is lacking in spatial planning? What data would good spatial planning need more of? Uh, we are living in, a, in times of uh, digital transformation. Let's say technology uh, is part of our everyday life since uh, the last 20 years, especially. Uh, although there are different uh, literature authors that have mentioned the importance of technology in our life since many years, uh, digitalization is really integrated to our everyday life. Uh, there are different companies, there are different uh, people that can track our movement, that are aware of our digital footprint. And the, the question is, how can we access to this information? So in my dissertation, in my research, um, I point out about this uh, inequality to access to data. So I will say for planning is, is important to enable processes of access to information and uh, access to data. From my point of view, uh, Stiglitz and uh, Amartya Sen, for example, address this clearly. They have developed a theory on uh, information asymmetry. I will say that access to guarantee access to data or guarantee uh, a democratic access to information leads to um, planning as a freedom tool. You can really take decisions on your on your territory on how you use resources and how you can uh, develop uh, in the future if you really know what is going on, if you are really informed. You know? And um, having partial access to data or partial access to information um, leads to a uh, different process of decision making. These, these processes of unequal access of information is not only shouldn't be only taken into consideration when you when we talked about marginal or informal settlements or informal communities. Um, there are many people accessing our information and our data as users every day. Google track our position or there are different companies that track our position uh, when we move with a telephone. Uh, or there are different companies uh, like, for example, Gmail can have access to uh, our uh, our emails and every every data that we are attaching. The, the emails. But we are not able to access to any data from them. I can say that um, with Accra, and there are different you know data that come come up on a daily basis. But then there is not necessarily any way to capture that data. And even if there is, again, it brings me back to my earlier point that it's not easily accessible. And if you do not know where to find it because online might not be updated and you can't go to the organizations, you know, like uh, maybe the Accra Metropolitan Assembly to um, ask for something. It's, it's like a long process. It's like a stringent process. So it's also kind of very difficult. And all of this, you know, ties with other things as well, maybe the environment, 
like gathering environment, environmental data as well is also kind of very difficult because some organizations, even if they collect, it's not easily accessible again. So accessibility is, accessibility to data is a main problem as well. And with your question about the data that is good for uh, spatial planning in terms of like uh, Accra or Ghana as well in Africa to some extent, it's highly dependent on, you know, the population. The population is what creates their data. There's, so the, the data must be like people centric. People centered data uh, in my, according with my definition is like how people operate on like that on a daily basis, you know, like in terms of like uh, traffic, if they are moving from work, this location to another and for Accra, for instance, uh, some people um, live in terms of like rural urban migration. Right? Um, some people live in like a different vicinity and their workplace is in, is in a, a different location. So in the mornings, they have to move from this place to another every single morning. In this case, like a traffic jam. And this this can be some sort of a data that can inform a government as to how to um, construct their roads, you know. So that is the kind of people-centric data that I I. I'm speaking about it's like data that is created by the people. So whenever you are planning something, it is 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 with the people in mind and with the people at heart. Um, case in point, um, there is this road in uh, Medina. It was a very popular uh, city in Accra. There was a lot of um, accidents because there was not a footbridge over the road, and it was out of that accident that you know informed the people that there is a need for a footbridge. But then. I believe that if they knew like the number of people that are within the location, like if they were they knew the schools that were there, so they can know the kind of students, the number of students that are going there on a daily basis. If they knew the, the traffic, you know, uh, you had like traffic data as to the number of cars that passed there, it could have informed them to, you know, create that uh, footbridge rather than having uh, maybe like a calamity to inform them, yeah, or rather than making a, a reactive, you know, um, decision. It could have been proactive if you had the data, you know. Sometimes the, the thing that we mistake about data is that data can either be useful or useless based on the value that you place on it. The world is fast moving, as I always say, and you need to be ahead of yourself. And data is like gold of this current age that we find ourselves. I mean, it's, the, it's called the information age for some reason. So if it's data that uh, it's, it's informing you, then you should gather as much data as possible and you should place like a, a, a good value on them, yeah. So, um, with terms of um, spatial planning, there are, um, in uh, in Ghana in Accra, uh, there are many organizations that when I was um, conducting the research to actually get concrete data data and to see how best we are using it, it it took a while, but I realized that this has to do a little bit with where to find the data. So it actually depends on what you are looking for, and because I knew what I was looking for, I was able to get to the website and I found out that there were some interesting uh, developments that were being made. Like for instance, our Accra Metropolitan Assembly in uh, conjunction with other institutions such as the Ministry of Inner Cities Development and Zungos, and also some the National Disaster Management, which there's flooding like this, they provide, you know, relief funds and uh, evacuation um, support to the people who are affected. They are, have some really nice and innovative um, systems put in place that is capturing data about Apogloshi, for instance, and then the other basin. They're capturing data about the amenities that is available, like the hospitals, the roads, the environment as well. And this is some of the work that I feel like it's important and more should be done in Ghana. And it's in conjunction with other international organizations, which is helping to make this data concrete as possible. And this data is actually user generated so they have like open map streets where um, the public can contribute, take pictures, you know, and fill, in, fill forms and surveys. And this is something that I feel like is very, very important to in having concrete data and having value out of that. Spatial planning here is non-existent. Like the best way to come up with that kind of data, first of all, would be to recruit people on merit. People who wouldn't easily be corrupted by some tycoon, but that's hard, hard, that's a very hard thing because our entire society is built on corruption. The other one could be the policies that the government makes as far as uh, trying, to, uh, trying to collect data from, so, uh, from communities that are hard to reach, but it is not in their best interest to do this again because 
you're looking at a, a type of politics, which is a divide and rule uh, model, where you know that it is not in their best interest to collect that data, first of all, and then share it with the rest. It, like, so, that, so whilst I, I hear you about spatial planning, it's almost inc incompatible with where I'm coming from because, you know, that's, that's how it looks like here. The other, the other would be school, the schools, because schools are in the best position still to, um, you know, acquire this data. As far as how many students they have in their community, how many people there are in the community, how many children are actually there in the community, and how many are going to the school. So the, the schools have a, a unique position to also say how hard is it for children to get to school from where they're coming from. So they can even look at like the transport routes. The schools are very important in finding out how many kids uh, passed the, the entry point, how many of them went to university, what happened to those ones. The schools are in the best position to kind of also follow up because they, you know, they kind of have at least the bare minimum of resources, even as far as like the, the relations are concerned with these individuals that have passed through their system. But again, it isn't that easy because that's kind of the ball game we're playing. We, we, don't, we don't do anything here unless it has something to do with money. We, we don't, it's hard to do something for the greater good, like special planning where you're talking about, okay, guys, let's consider that the entire Eastern region should uh, be more of a factory type um, economy whereby the, the students who have gone to these schools can easily be employed in these schools or let's try and build roads coming from this place to that place so that people can easily have access to the airport because hey we have a lot of tourists coming into the country you know that doesn't happen well, we suffer a great deal from the lack of availability of good data. And part of the problem is the disaggregation of data. That's a big problem. It's gotten a lot better in the last 30 years. There's a wonderful new book out by Caroline Perez called Invisible Women. It's on data bias. She calls it data bias in a world designed for men. And she brings up the question in Sweden of whether they had disaggregated um, well, the area that they were looking at was snow removal. Now, one would think that snow removal is totally gender neutral. And she says it turns out not to be because the communities prioritize their snow removal in terms of first the road, secondly, the pedestrian sidewalks and pathways, and third, bicycle paths. Well, it turned out that about 70% of women utilize the sidewalks. The men utilize the roads because they drove to work. So why would this matter, that the women were somewhat inconvenienced? The problem was that women were racking up accidents by slipping on the ice-covered paths. And so the health costs were far, far higher for women in the winter because they didn't have dry paths to proceed on. So once they switched and began to take care of the paths first, they saw the health effects coming down into more normal areas. So I live in a very snowy area, and this is something that I had never thought about, never in a million years. So there are so many questions that we're not asking. For, from my personal experience, I worked on patrilocality, the question of where brides go to live once they're married. And there is no data whatsoever on this practice at all. We had to use our best talents in ethnographic research and go back farther in history than, than we usually do. We usually use very current data, but we decided that we'd have to take the approach that historical patterns from say 20 years ago would might still have something to say about this. But patrilocality turned out to be the greatest predictor of what the syndrome score would be. So the question, if you remove a woman from her own natal family and put her not into an apartment with her partner where she and her husband can raise the children together, but you put her in the situation of living with her in-laws, 
It takes away so much of her personal voice, the ability to become educated, the ability to be employed, the ability to have any say in the number of children she has or in how they're raised. And it also indicates a family centeredness that leads to some of the variables we look at in terms of security and national corruption. So th there, there are practices that we've simply decided to have passed away, that there's no use paying attention to them, that turn out to be enormously important. And our personal sense is that this is an issue that's in transition. And the better we can track it, the better we have a sense of how countries are moving into a situation that's better for women in the home. I'll give you another, one of, our, one of our newest variables is called mobility of women. And that looks at the ability of women to move around town without being bothered. So are they safe? Do they have to worry about being attacked? Do they have to worry about being raped? Are there cat calls? Are they being sexually harassed on the street? And this proves to be a, a real issue in some countries. And it's been fascinating. We noticed that women in certain locales were taking the situation into their own hands. For example, in Cairo, Egypt, women put up a telephone app that was essentially an, an alert on where in town sexual assaults were taking place so that women knew what to avoid. But also, it's a, it's a real boon for law enforcement. What value is attributed to the existence of certain data versus no data? I think it's uh, the, a, a very important point is uh, how to transform the data that is acquired by the drones. What do we do with this information? Um, there are a series of different transformations after we receive this raw data that we need to be aware of. We need to understand that uh, the compatibility of different platforms, for example, to transform this data, because every step of transformation usually lose information or lose some data. Value is it's it's relative, you know. You can have data, but if it's not useful for you, you wouldn't you wouldn't know what to do with it. And this was a uh, case in point with the game that we were creating. We wanted to create a. Uh, awareness about sanitation and the people who more or less we were trying to create the awareness about and for they knew the problem that was you know happening to them they were involved in it and they were facing the problem but they didn't knew, know how it affected them you know uh, on a broad in a broader um, scheme of things with Ghana as a country uh, we, we heavily place value on data but then I mean, this, this implementation is being done, but it might seem like a, a really slow um, shift because uh, there is a gap between uh, maybe the execution, I should say. So we, Accra is, as I always use, because I'm in Accra, the order basin is like, a, it's like a part where Abu Bloshi is located that we created a game about. It's like 60% of the population of Accra. And every year there is like an annual perennial flood and this was because of choke gutters and, you know, and basically our own uh, shortcomings as human beings. There is data about it, but it doesn't necessarily translate into the solutions that we are making. We are dredging um, gutters. We are, you know, making, having cleanup exercises. And that shows that we are placing value on the data, but its execution is taking a relatively long time. And it will be interesting to also involve another aspect or example from um, Boston. I was doing a little bit of research and I realized that um, in Boston, they, because of data that they had with um, traffic and with schools, like people-centric data, we were able to save um, $5 million because they were able to develop an algorithm that uses the data of um, the school bus traffic routes and where the students were going from on a daily basis and even uh, persons, in, persons with disabilities. And we're able to develop an algorithm that improved their bus routes. And this saved time from the human and bus planners. And also, it saved them money as well. And this money was reinvested into classroom activities. So that is kind of the value that you place on data. And likewise, the value that data can't give you. And this is something that um, I believe 
we as a country or as a continent should look at. The African population is smart as hell. We're just, we just don't have the information. To, we are completely blank. Like we don't see anything. And the only thing that we see comes from the internet. And in a country like Uganda, it's being taxed so that we are kept in the dark more, you know? I, and it completely changes how we, are, we as a population act and behave. From a Ugandan, uh, uh, an individual who wants to make something of myself in this world, I'd like to exist in a world that has, that puts value, value on data. That data helps to inform your, you know, like, like your, what you're missing, what's not missing. It's, it's a difficult situation because, yeah, we, we need the data, but the one, the, the, some of us that do get the data, we use it to steal instead of, you know, actually helping the community or making the cash cow fatter and fatter. We just find the cash cow skinny and even milk it until it's dead. And yes, I, I attribute value to data. The entire population attributes the value to data. But that data is used to prey on the population because the people who hold that data, no one is holding them accountable. And even though it's not that much data to begin with, they still use it to press the society and to make more money from the society. I mean, if I had to put myself in their shoes, I guess it would be a difficult position because I think there's more to it than just the leaders. I think the, the, I think the European and American agenda overall has no interest in Africa being independent. So again, that's a much different power play from the one I'm assuming. So I guess these guys are working with the best they can. If you can't save an entire nation, you'd rather save your family. I was really thrilled yesterday with the announcement of the Nobel Prize in economics because these three economists have been doing applied work, experimental work on how to solve some of the most intractable development problems problems like how to help what what helps children learn most and the with without data without good data we don't know where the problems are i was raised by a journalist and so my whole life has been predicated on the fact that if we don't have the data we we literally don't know where the problems are or what the arguments are or what are the areas that we should be looking in and it's, it's really quite thrilling to see what data we have, but it's of concern to see that we're, we're not always tracking things as well as we could. And we, we ran into problems. We, we look at every country over 200,000 population, and there, there were some important areas that we had data for say 67 countries or 96 countries but there was no data on the others. And so we were stuck. We really couldn't use that data because there, it was too little. We did, our, our sample size was too small and we couldn't do what we were doing for the entire project. So those parts had to be um, e eliminated for this study. So the, and then there's the question of bad data. We, we just put together a scale. And let me just say that if you go to the woman stats, woman, W-O-M-A-N, stats.org website, there is a group of maps where the scaling is applied to the, all the countries in the world. But one of the most recent maps that we did was on rape prevalence and we, We've had a very, very difficult time doing that. It, they ended up triangulating a lot of data, but the country with, that came out the worst in the world is, can you guess? It was Sweden. And the best were countries like India or <laughs> countries where we know the rate prevalence is very, very high. But Sweden reports, Sweden reports rapes, and the, the statistics are available, where other countries are keeping it quiet. 
So in the Middle East, for in North Africa, where I do most of my work, HIV AIDS prevalence is very, very low. But we're quite suspicious that it's not as low as they say it is. So one of the big issues is what's politically um, correct to report and what's in the national interest to remain silent on. But without that data, there you, you cannot design programs and begin to work. What, one of the things that, that we like doing, which fits with your concern with spatial interpretations, is um, we map all of our data onto a world map, which allows us to look at trends within regions and to begin thinking about causes for why this is going on. So, for example, is drought a factor? Can we look at Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa and say, how does drought impact what's going on? But it allows us to look at a region, at a group of countries that are generally somewhat the same, that are following the same trends, and seeing if there's an outlier. So it, the, the maps kind of alert us to problems. We're finding that we're learning a great deal about women, but we're also learning a great deal about, it's not just, we're not just talking about women and children, but we're talking about men and men's well being as well. And that by looking at women and the way that women interact in families, we are also, we believe, laying out ways for men to be more prosperous, healthy, successful, happy in all that they're doing. So we believe that our research benefits everyone. Through our interviews and research process, we identified three different types of data gaps in spatial planning. Firstly, data that is not collected in certain areas. Think of plot boundaries, demographic data, or economic revenue. This is not available everywhere in the world. Secondly, data which is perceived as not possible to survey. This applies to intangible data, like the happiness of a population or feeling of security. This type of data gap is especially interesting since new methods of collecting data, different indicators, etc. could potentially lead the way to closing this gap. However, it is also heavily linked to the importance we give data collection. If the community gives precedence to a certain type of data, we find a way to collect it. And our preconditions of collecting data have an influence as well. This applies especially to the fields of gender, informality, and other marginalized groups. Thirdly, data which exists or is collected but isn't accessible. An example of this type of data in spatial planning is transportation data through Google Maps, accommodation data through Airbnb or other private companies that collect data but don't share this information publicly. What are your experiences in regards to the data gap? Are there more types of data gaps? What value do you attribute to the existence of certain data versus no data? Let us know in the comments below. This was Breaking Paradigms by Constanze Frech and Sarah Couchet. Be part of the conversation. If you like what we do, consider supporting us and join our Patreon community. Special thanks to our supporters Thomas Fischer. Connect with us on Facebook, YouTube and at breakingparadigms.org. Content and editing by Constanze Frech and Sarah Couchet. Sound design by Didac Barroso and Florian Frech.